Okay. All right. The introductions. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Joan and Donna and Roberta for inviting us. And I'm excited that we've got people from different leagues here and from the community. This is not what we were expecting. And it's great that people are really motivated to hear about this kind of work. Now, many of you know um, about League, obviously. League is uh, very strong in helping people exercise their right to vote and to get informed. We're great at registering people, you know, getting the elections on people's radar, educating through um, studies that we do of different issues, and of course, the forums. And that all works great for people who are motivated to take part in our electoral system. But we know that there are a lot of people who aren't. I mean, there are people who will just say to me, I don't vote, right? So how do we reach those people? And a lot of those people are, they're fed up. They, they're just so disillusioned with our system that we need to bring them back in. Others, they vote, but they don't feel like they need to get educated because they either identify as Republican or Democrat they vote strictly along party lines and that's all they need to know because we've come to think of the other side as the enemy. So league doesn't work very well in that kind of setting and how do we bring those people in? And there are a number of groups that are working to bridge this divide and it's actually working. We're, we're bringing hope to people. Um, what we, we and others have found is that if you bring people with different views together and you give them a good structure, then they can talk to each other and they can form relationships and they change how they think about the others and they change sometimes how they think about the issues. So um, Brave Rangers is not the only group doing this, but um, you know we've got a couple of things that make us distinct. Um, Chuck, can you go to the next slide, please? So there's growing interest in depolarization. Um, most Americans believe that our trust in each, our low trust in each other makes it harder to solve problems. And however, most also believe that it's possible to rebuild that trust. And communities can be like little laboratories for how to do that. You know, essentially one, one person at a time, one community at a time. And so, you know, I'll talk a little bit about um, how Braver Angels is different, and then Chuck will talk about our different programs. And the next slide, please. So two of the things that make us distinct is that we have, um, Bill Doherty has designed most of our workshops, and he is a family therapist, and he's also at the University of Minnesota. And he recognized that the kind of techniques that are used in family therapy could also be applied to conflicts at an intersocial level. So he was part of the very first workshop that was held in Ohio after the 2016 election um, with, a, with a couple of um, David Blank and, uh, and, um, and David Lapp who wanted to bring together Clinton and Trump supporters. And Bill said, wait, you need to have, you can't just put them together in a room. You need to have a process. So he designed that and it was very successful. The other thing that distinguishes us is that we have a 50-50 rule at certainly at, the, at least at the upper levels of, um, of the organization. Our board of directors, our convention and our alliances have to be half red leaning and half blue leaning people. And that's how we keep that balance. Um, when we hold debates, which Chuck will mention later, we make sure we have people on both sides of the issue to speak and we alternate people speaking in favor of the, the issue or against it. So it's all about balance and making people feel safe speaking their truth and telling us why they feel the way they feel. So that's the thing that really makes us different. Next slide, please. So we were um, really inspired by Abraham Lincoln and the way he wanted people to come together when the Civil War was breaking us apart and called on the nation to choose our better, our, our better angels to restore our bonds of affection. And so this is really the inspiration for what Braver Angels does. We changed our name in 2020 because it takes bravery 
to get outside your bubble and speak to somebody who you know feels differently. And so the name Braver Angels then reflects that. And I mean, from the very beginning, it was clear that there was a deep passion for this kind of work. The, we've got a documentary of one of the early Red Blue workshops and I've seen it three times and every time it moves me to tears. It's, you can see how people are really finally understanding that the other side is not evil and that they've got the same kinds of um, values and issues, you know, as each other. And it's, they really come together and they really bond. Next slide, please. Okay. And our truck is gonna take over and talk about our different programs and then uh, we'll switch back to me later on, Chuck. Yeah, let me say one more thing about Lincoln is, uh, it always seems to me that if you talk about better angels and we'll come together when the better angels of our nature, you know, uh, call upon us, it means that we have something else too. And it means that we need to make a choice toward better angels. So that's also kind of the message behind what we're doing is we need to choose what kind of country uh, we wanna live in uh, in order to defend democracy as uh, the league says, or depolarize America is kind of our uh, slogan. So one way of looking at it is that there's this new kind of prejudice and the term partyism came from a joint study by Stanford and Princeton. And it found that uh, this, this new prejudice is really already deep within us to the point where we're actually disadvantaging people on the other side based on their political affiliation um, or based on their uh, political beliefs. So uh, unlike racial and religious prejudice, we haven't worked on this yet. That's really the, the, the kind of the first difference. So we have made progress in those other areas, but right now uh, political prejudice is just sort of wide open. Um, like racial and religious prejudice, partyism is supported by stereotyping. So it actually feels kind of, you know, what's wrong with it to um, discriminate against somebody or preju have prejudice against them based on political beliefs. It feels like, you know, what's wrong with that. But what we're actually doing most of the time is um, exercising a prejudice based on our stereotype of what the other people believe in. So that's a major problem. Um, and then like uh, racial and religious prejudice, it does lead to discrimination. So here's a couple of examples of that. And I did a red blue workshop, which brought together conservatives and uh, liberals in uh, at Knox College in Galesburg. And the conservative club, there were uh, a bunch of uh, young men from the conservative club were uh, the reds uh, in that group. and they decided they wanted to reach out to some liberals on campus. And you know, there is no liberal club on campus. It's just the campus is liberal. Um, so they wrote this note to them saying, you know, dear liberal cause club, it was like the, um, you know, climate change club or something. Uh, we'd like to meet for a fun afternoon of pizza together just to socialize. Uh, maybe we could debate something silly like, having is a hot dog, a, a sandwich. So what do you say? And they got back a note from the liberal club, um, dear com, uh, conservative club, we say, no, we won't socialize with a bunch of fascist, homophobic misogynists. You don't belong on campus. And um, this is, it's kind of close to another story. I know three braver angels who I've just met in the past six months who are all affiliated with a major Metropolitan University at a very liberal university and all three of them independently and they didn't know each other told me that if it was known that they were conservative, they would be fired. And that initially sounded to me like that sounds like overstatement, but then the, the guy who was a uh, professor told me some of the comments of the department chair at departmental meeting meetings. And the other two told me stories too. And it's really reached this point that we're going to disadvantage somebody based on their political beliefs to the point where they might lose their job. And on top of that, the uh, stereotyping and the demonizing that we're doing right now, we all know is it has led to this, at least a specter of political violence that we've had a taste of now. Um, just back at the uh, Capitol insurrection. 
So part of the reason is that a growing body of social science research demonstrates that Americans on both sides exaggerate the extremism of the other side. So we see things on TV and we think that everybody on the other side is just like the worst actor on the other side. Um, and one of the ways that they've tested it is uh, there was a group called More in Common that did research in 2019 by surveying Democrats and Republicans and asking them, uh, do they agree with these kind of extreme statements? So the first one is most police are bad people. And uh, what they found was that 85% of Democrats disagreed with that statement. Republicans predicted only 48%. So in other words, Republicans predicted that more than half uh, of Democrats would agree that most police are bad people. And the same thing with the immigration question, the next one, 85% uh, of Republicans agreed that immigration can be positive for the country when properly controlled. Democrats predicted only 52%. So there is this perception gap. And one of the interesting things in the study is that for Democrats, and this wasn't true of Republicans, uh, but as the level of education gets higher, the degree of exaggeration and inaccuracy gets higher, which is kind of counterintuitive. Um, but you know, the belief is that uh, people with the higher degrees also might read the most, uh, consume the most news media, consume the most social media, see the extreme examples out there and kind of take it to heart. And there is also uh, a correlation that uh, with the higher levels of education, the less likely Democrats are to have a friend who is Republican. So somebody who could kind of water down uh, the stereotype. So what we're seeing, and this, I, this kind of thing I think is a result of Joe Biden's campaign uh, and talking about ending what he called the grim era of demonization. And I think uh, we've had people really on both sides fire kind of warning shots or a preeminent attacks that they're not gonna participate in bridging the divide. They don't believe in bridges, they don't want bridges. So this is an example from the Times. Uh, it was a progressive who wrote, reach out to Trump supporters. They said, I tried, I give up. And the, the kind of the moral of the story was that he had uh, attempted to talk to and give speeches to Trump supporters. And lo and behold, they still were Trump supporters at the end of the conversation. So he considered it a failure and they were unreachable. Uh, when in fact, and Madeline's gonna uh, tell us that the, the main thing that we uh, preach in talking across the political divide is to abandon the expectation that you're gonna convince somebody to abandon their core principles and their way of looking at the world in the span of a conversation. That it needs to be a conversation just to get to know and understand each other better and really to change the way that they think of you. Um, even worse than just saying it can't be done uh, are people who are now saying that it is morally wrong to talk to people on the other side because that would normalize, uh, you know, the hateful, you know, whatever. And it, it's just hard to uh, understand how we can have a democracy when we can't look at people in the eye as equals and have conversations uh, with them and that we've created, is it a group of untouchables that we should uh, not talk to them at all, not find out what's on their minds. Banwin, I think this is you. All right. Right, so, so at Braver Angels, we have a pledge, and this really underlies essentially all of what we do. So let me just read through it. So as individuals, Oops, sorry, we try to understand the other side's point of view, even if we don't agree with it. In our communities, we engage those we disagree with, looking for common ground and ways to work together. In politics, we support principles that bring us together rather than divide us. So what you can see here is that it begins with individuals and you don't see on here, you know, educating the other side so that they can see the light. That's, that's not part of what we do. And although that may seem like it's, it's kind of pointless, um, 
you know, I hope you'll be convinced as we go through what we do here. And if you take part in any of our programs that um, what we do does work. Kind of next slide, please. So what we do here is um, we've got a couple of reflexes and kind of automatic ways that we converse with each other. You know, things that have become part of our culture that we need to overcome. So um, the first one is that we tend to focus on differences when we're talking with somebody instead of focusing on what we agree with. And then um, when we do that, you know, so if I'm talking to somebody who thinks differently, I say my piece, they jump in with why I'm wrong and they say their piece. I'm not really, really taking to heart what they're saying. I'm just thinking about how I'm going to respond as soon as they pause to take a breath. Maybe I won't even wait for that. And so it's this back and forth clashing. And then, you know, in the end, we both walk away and we're probably thinking, yeah, you know, you can't talk to those people. They, they, they just don't listen. They, they're crazy. So we have to get past that. Um, there's also kind of a pattern of, you know, seeming to ask a question, but it isn't really a question to learn really about what they think and why they think it. It's kind of a gotcha question. And we do an exercise in um, one of our programs where one group is preparing questions for the other group. And although they're supposed to be invitations to, you know, express their thoughts and values so that we can listen and understand them better, people fall into the habit of just composing a question that's really designed to teach the other side a lesson. You know, make them see their foolishness, um, kind of back them into a corner and, you know, until they submit to our way of looking at the world. So that's obviously not going to be very productive. It might feel good, but it, it's not very productive. And then finally, you know, we get into this habit of um, interrupting and counterpointing. And, you know, I, I see this in my conversations, um, even kind of casual conversations, that it's, it's kind of unnatural to let the other person speak at the pace they want and, you know, to just sit there and listen and absorb. It's, we feel like we need to interrupt immediately. And um, if somebody says something we disagree with, that if we were to let that stand, it would almost seem like we agreed with it. So we have to jump in and um, interrupt them and contest that. And it just ends up being, you know, kind of a fight. And so the family therapy structure is to help people learn to really listen. It's, and not just wait, not just wait until they can get a word in, but really listen and try to understand. Next slide, please. So, you know, some of the features that we teach in our workshops, and Chuck mentioned this earlier, the, the prime directive is to, you know, abandon the expectation that you can persuade your conversational partner. And, you know, many people may think, well, then why would I bother talking to them if we're, if, if we're not going to get anywhere? And, you know, I hope you'll see that good things can still come out of this approach. Um, you know, the, the paradox is that if you establish your ethos of listening and speaking respectfully, then you actually have a better chance of persuading. And in my experience, um, I, I've been both ways. I've been persuaded and I've persuaded other people to think differently, but it doesn't happen in the conversation. It's, you know, I haven't been in conversations where people say, oh, yeah, right. And, and I don't do that either. It's, you know, I go away. I, 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 I might not have acted like I heard what they said, but I did. And I think about it and it, it does move me a little bit. And I can tell, you know, that it moves other people that they, you know, I'll, I'll hear my husband later quoting me on something, whereas I didn't even think, you know, he thought I was saying anything that was very useful at all. So, um, you know, another part of it is that if you treat someone respectfully, they, they'll treat you respectfully and they'll answer you respectfully. You know, we, we mirror each other. And so if, if I go in with a kind of, um, you know, an arrogant or an argumentative manner, that's what the other person's going to respond with. And if I go in and, and I'm listening respectfully, they'll do the same thing. So, you know, this is part of what we want people to learn. And of course, you know, this won't work with all people all the time, but it, it works often enough. And, you know, if you take part in any of our workshops and you, when we have people give some feedback later, it's really a novel feeling for people to really feel heard. <laughs> 
even even when it's you know just kind of an exercise in a program it's um it's it's a really good um novel feeling next slide please okay, okay. so this is where i turn it over to chuck and he'll give you some details on some of what we do yeah so uh madeline mentioned that uh bill doherty uh, a family therapist designed our workshops and uh, we are kind of a fractured family. Uh, America is like a fractured, alienated family in that we're not talking to each other very much or very productively, but we are talking about each other quite a bit and we're kind of lining up allies. So uh, we've created um, several different online experiences um, to deal with that. And our workshops to begin with, there are two different kinds. Uh, ones that build skills and one that create experiences. So the skills ones, the first three are actually skill-based experiences. Depolarizing Within takes a look at uh, uh, talking to people on our own side, like-minded people. Uh, when things go off the rails and they begin expressing contempt, you know, they're worthless, dismissal, they don't matter, um, stereotyping them or ridiculing them. Skills for bridging the divide workshops are to talk to people, especially people who you have a relationship with um, and the focus is on uh, who disagree with, with us politically and the focus is on uh, mapping differences accurately instead of based on stereotypes, but also looking for common ground in terms of values uh, and goals for the country and then affirming the importance of the relationship as well. Uh, families and politics is, is kind of uh, geared toward, um, you know, problem members of the family when it comes to politics and especially at times like Thanksgiving and developing a skill for kind of handling uh, Thanksgiving dinner. Um, we also have the experience based ones and the Red Blue Workshop is kind of our most famous one. Uh, and the one that uh, I love, I really love doing um, a group of reds and a group of blues, usually about seven or eight of each meet. And then there is a series of structured experiences and we'll go through it in greater detail. But this is an experience of being with people on the other side and hearing them talk about themselves. And it's not an experience that most of us <clears throat> can put together for ourselves very easily. Uh, the Common Ground uh, Workshop is another one uh, where you come together about some issue, different sides of an issue, and you look for points of agreement. And to give you an idea of, we did one on abortion, the issue of abortion, and there were 20 points uh, of agreement afterwards, which can then form the basis for action together, uh, whether it's going to a legislator and saying, we agree on this point, or uh, writing a letter to the editor or something. <clears throat> um, we also have the debates and these are different type of debates. Madeline's a debate chair and it involves everybody in the room uh, can get up and give a speech and then stand for a couple of questions. So you, everyone is uh, invited to make a speech pro or con on a difficult issue. Uh, it has a kind of lighthearted uh, feeling uh, you're allowed to bang, it's called, which is which means just sort of like in the British Parliament, if somebody says something that you like, you kind of like, you know, bang on the table or something. Uh, we can't do that on Zoom, so we've invented the jazz fingers. This is our, our equivalent of, I like that, I like that. Um, so that's our debates, and uh, all of these are online now. I'm proud of the way that we uh, have put stuff online in a hurry and gotten it right uh, after the pandemic hit. So the Red Blue Workshop, um, we've done, we did about 325 of them nationally. We are a national organization active in all 50 states. We're an all volunteer organization, pretty much. All of us in Illinois are volunteers. Uh, there's about, you know, just a handful of paid people throughout the country. Um, the Red Blue workshops uh, are now online. We split it into two, two and a half hour uh, sessions. And uh, what we find over and over again, let me explain the, the picture on top there, looks like it is a fishbowl, which is one of the exercises that we do. And in that, one of the groups uh, 
it looks, uh, the, let's say it's the uh, blue group is sitting in the middle. The other group, the red group is ringed around them. Only the people in the middle are talking. The other group is just listening. And they answer two questions. The speakers answer two questions. Uh, first, why do you think that your uh, side's policies and values are good for the country? And then there is a kind of humility question. What concerns or reservations do you have about your own side? So you're only talking about your, your side, you're not attacking the other side. And what people come away with time after time after time is surprise. And I think the surprise is because of the expectations that we have that the other side is made up of a bunch of cartoon villains like we've seen on TV. Um, instead, they're surprised, first of all, that they like people on the other side, which says a lot about you know, where we're at now, why should it be a surprise to people that they like people when they meet them? Um, second, that there is a range of opinion on the other side, because we thought they were all the same. Um, and a lot of times that comes out in the second question, you know, you don't like the same thing about your side that I don't like about it, it turns out. Um, and then finally, that we share common values or goals for the country. Uh, there was a Pew poll Pew Research that said that four out of five Biden supporters and four out of five Trump supporters believe that people on the other side do not share basic core American values. In other words, that they're un-American. And when you, you're sitting in a room with people and you may still disagree about the policy, but you hear common values, that really explodes uh, the stereotype. So the other uh, workshop that I mentioned, Depolarizing Within, is really three parts to it. The first part is introspective, the uh, lesson in humility. So let's go through that. First, you look at things like, uh, how often do I find myself thinking about those people on the other political side without regard for the variation among them? Or how often do I find myself assigning mainly self-serving or negative motives to the other group? mainly positive motives to my group. So, you know, my group is all, you know, Mother Teresa and their group is all the worst person you can think of. And uh, we have a bad habit in this country of just automatically assigning bad motivations to the other side, like they're evil all day long. Uh, how often do I find myself focusing on the most extreme or outrageous ideas and people on the other side, thereby making it hard to see how a reasonable person could remain in that uh, group. Um, and how often do I feel a rush of pleasure when I uh, share uh, ridicule with uh, my friends of those crazies uh, on the other side? So that's the first part is an introspection. Then the second part is how do you criticize without attacking the uh, uh, people on the other side for their motivations and you know whether they're good people, whether they're crazy or not. Uh, and then the third part is a communication skills. How do you intervene in your own side when things go off the rails without getting fired from your, your own side? Okay, and uh, very uh, happy to announce that uh, we formed our first alliance in Illinois. An alliance is a group of reds and blues who have been to a workshop and uh, wanna continue meeting with each other. Uh, so just in January, uh, we formed a statewide Zoom alliance. I think this is a natural as well for the League of Women Bo Voters. If you wanted to uh, form a sort of a parallel um, alliance, and you meet monthly usually. It's really local control. You meet as often as you want to. Uh, and it's about discussion across the divide, but it's also kind of fulfilling this mission of trying to depolarize uh, Illinois. And uh, that means that you can take a deeper dive into things and you can experiment with things that Braver Angels hasn't done before. We're all trying to solve a problem and we don't know exactly what the solution is. We're just sort of bravely, you know, moving forward and, and seeing what works. And the alliances are a, sort of an engine for new things. Um, I'd be happy to work with uh, the league or chapters in the league if you wanted to recruit members, some reds and some blues and, and put something together. Um, 
All right. So, you know, people want to know, is it, does this work? And we don't have great data right now. We were about to start collecting data when the pandemic hit. So I'll show you what we do have. And, you know, one is that there's just this rapidly growing interest in depolarization. So, you know, just in 2020, Braver Angels greatly increased um, the number of dues paying members, the number of subscribers and the uh, monthly website traffic. Um, just since spring, when we went online, we've attracted more than 22,000 unique registrants. We're serving about four times as many Americans per month as we used to. I helped out in a debate a couple weeks ago, and we had over a thousand people in that debate in different rooms. So we're, you know, we're selling out of our programs like within a couple of days of them being posted, and there's just a lot of interest in this. Next slide, please. And uh, Madeline, I think we're almost at 30 minutes, so maybe we should just skip to the final slide. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. So let's skip. And um, yeah. So if you, you know, if you're moved and you want to learn more, you can go to our website and look at all the different things we have there. Um, it'd be great to have you become a member. It's only $12 a year. Um, you know, we're mostly a volunteer organization, just like League, but we do have a few paid staff and we do have expenses, of course. Um, we have a lot of online experiences. I don't know, we Illinois just had several events in the last month or so. I don't know that we've got any coming up in the near future, but there's always something going on nationally. And so with Zoom, it's easy to participate in those. Um, and then like Chuck was saying, if you want to organize an event or organize a local alliance, um, that would be great. We'd be happy to work with you. You know, I think that the League and Brave Angels, they have, um, sort of complementary missions and we can really help each other. Brave Angels restores people's hope and League takes it to the next step and helps them, you know, those people to become uh, more engaged um, in society and in their civic life. And we can also help each other diversify our memberships. So I think there's a lot of potential for us to work well together. And thank you very much for this opportunity. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm actually going to put my uh, contact information in chat. Um, and we would be very excited to work with uh, your chapter. I know there's several chapters here uh, to bring in a workshop um, or to uh, uh, show the documentary or work with you in forming an alliance. Uh, anything uh, that sounds good to you that would further our mission, we're there for it. And the first step is to contact uh, me. Terrific. Chuck and Madeline, thank you so much. I got a lot out of the program. If you would hang on for just a little bit, I'm going to ask Marianne to pull the names right quick um, for the raffle, and then I'm going to open it up right after that for Q&A. Okay. There's one. This is from the guest. So we have, we have uh, Pete, I'm not going to say your name right, I'm sure. Oh, Pellegrino, I'm sorry. Pete Pellegrino. Okay. And um, Renee, both my, my pop, oh, Renee, I'm sorry. I can't get all those syllables sometimes. <laughs> Pellepopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopopop
and um, and I do apologize. I didn't know I had turned off my video. <laughs> a new new device. Anyway, so we have uh, Barbara um, Hulstead, Hulstead, Hulstead. Sorry, and um, David Pileski, Pileski are our two members. So, and of course the members we do have your information. It's the guest that we need to have uh, a little bit more information. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you. I'd like to open it up now to um, Chuck and Madeline. Um, I'd like to open it up to the group for questions. Hi, this is Erica Nelson. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, compelling presentation. Uh, I will tell you that it's um, uh, it's uh, just grace-filled work that you're doing. So thank you so much for, for this and for having such a great structure. There was a movie that came out a couple of years ago called Best of Enemies um, about a charrette that was held in Durham, North Carolina in the early 70s to uh, discuss desegregation of the schools. I don't know if you're familiar with that movie, yeah. uh, Best of Enemies. Uh, and a true story based on a true story, uh, but would be worth seeing because I think some of your structure aligns <clears throat> with how they ran this very uh, uh, kind of um, certainly nonpartisan, but also engaged uh, connection. And your description, Chuck, of, uh, of not um, expecting you know, people to uh, be convinced uh, was really part of the messaging of the movie. My question is, um, have you, have you, do you discuss at all the struggle that, um, that in, in particularly right now with this pandemic, um, and I will own this struggle myself with, um, it's brought more family members of mine who I have those kind of tough conversations with, but my struggle is in the middle of a pandemic this belief that uh, isn't real and we don't need to worry about that and it's all made up, et cetera, et cetera, and you know, point fingers at, at you know, another party. Um, do, do you find that people are talking or feeling like it's different because of this public health crisis and in fact, lives are at stake when you, uh, when you, um, uh, have belief systems that don't align with science and in fact put other people at risk. Are you noticing any of that conversation being different than perhaps what you've had in the past? Uh, thanks, it's a great question. I think it's on everybody's mind, that type of thing where it seems like there is something really dangerous going on. Um, and I think that you know, living in a free country, we're sort of, uh, we should have been working on this like in 1980, we're not. Uh, we are uh, playing makeup and it means that people have beliefs that can be uh, harmful and uh, we just need to talk to them. And if we can, the root cause of a lot of it is this demonization of the other side and the belief that the other side will sell us things that are not true and try to push us around uh, and that we want to be on our own side in our own tribe, doing our own thing and showing that we don't care what they say. Um, and all we can do is our best and that's to have conversations with them. Uh, and these are conversations. They're not just listening to them. They're also pointing out um, and uh, it can be hopefully like what uh, Madeline said, you may not get them and you won't probably get them to immediately say, you know, I guess you were right. I guess it is a big health threat, uh, but down the line when um, somebody that they know gets sick and it was doing something that you told them that they shouldn't be doing, a light bulb can get off. So what we're doing in a way, and I think of this as the $12 a year, is kind of betting on the American people. And what you've described, Erica, is a reason not to bet on us, uh, that we really have these deep problems and the stakes are high. There's no doubt about it. The stakes are high in, uh, like the, in the view that the election was stolen, uh, for example. Um, but all we can do is do our best. Uh, and that means making contact with people on the other side to change their view of us. Um, and it's, it may be unsatisfying, but 
that's all we can do. And we need to do it. We need to actually do it because I think it does have an effect when you don't disown somebody from the family, you don't ridicule them and so forth, um, and you keep talking to them. So thank you. And by the way, thank you for thank the, you. the kind words about the presentation. If you like the slides, that's Donna Limper. She, made, she took our slides and she made them much better than they were. So thank you to Donna too. So another question? I have a question. Uh, yes, Renee. My name's Renee. Yeah. Um, growing up, I remember my parents always having their belief systems, but quietly respecting the other side. When do you think this started to really break down between the Hatfields and the McCoys? I think uh, that's a part of it. And Madeline, jump in when you want to. Um, I, I think that's a, a question that we can't answer right now. I think it's happened over about a 50 year period that we began to lose trust in each other and in government. And it's from many different causes. And that, that's really what makes it so complex is that, you know, first of all, in order to solve it, the left can't solve it for the right and the right can't solve it for the left. It needs to be people working together. That's a, kind of the Braver Angels model because it is a relationship or a conversation uh, or something, there have been, and we're not currently talking very well to each other and the divide is, is real and uh, is destructive. Um, then the, the causes, there are so many of them, it's hard to get around. Some of them are technological. There were changes uh, also to news media. We're imbibing outrage now like if you're on social media every day, uh, human beings didn't used to do that. And what's the effect uh, of, of that? Um, and then there have been political differences where things uh, have become politicized that before were, were not a part of the, a matter of government or, or not. Um, so we're moving forward. Uh, I'm absolutely, I can't put a finger on when things went bad. I can put a finger on who I think was responsible, but I won't. Um, I think there are people in groups that were kind of in an outsized way responsible for the uh, causing a part of the division. Um, but we've become very vulnerable in a sense, and the League in Defending Democracy, um, I think, is involved in this as well. We're vulnerable to demagogues. We're vulnerable to people dividing us uh, out of a fear of the evil people on the other side. And uh, I am 100% sure that a part of the remedy will be in talking to people on the other side. Because when we see with our own eyes uh, that it isn't like it's portrayed, um, that's when things begin to change and when maybe uh, we will stop electing people who use that wedge to, to kind of divide us. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's a great question. I don't know is the answer. Um, there are experts who can uh, rattle off a dozen reasons for the divide and I'm sure they're right, but it doesn't do us any good until the broad group of people actually acts upon us. So uh, Donna, did you have a question? Actually, kind of a more of a, a discussion. Um, I. Uh... If this is for both, the, if there's anybody still left from Glen Ellen or the other leagues, um, and then also from uh, our league, the uh, Roselle Bloomingdale League. So I think on the heels of this presentation, we want to be able to take next steps. Um, I think Chuck if, and Madeline, uh, I believe when I went on your website, you have a list of books uh, that are pertaining to uh, bridging the partisan divide and I know our book club has a I mean excuse me our league has a book club and maybe we could do um, a double a double league book uh, regarding the partisan divide that we read together with the Glen Ellen League or any of the other leagues that are on the call tonight that was one thought and then the other thought I had was I think some of our members might be um, co-members of maybe Rotary or the Lions Club 
um, and where we could maybe cultivate some uh, some more reds. I know I know it is more challenging to get reds than blues who want to do this. So um, I definitely want to start organizing a red blue workshop in our area, Roselle Bloomingdale. I have a draft letter written to churches looking for people who might want to do this work because I think churches might be a good avenue of generating um, people who might want to do this work with the league. Um, so anyway, any thoughts on that? Um, I'd love to hear from other people. Uh, this is Erica again, uh, and there's several of us from Glen Ellen, and uh, I, I jotted that down. In fact, Sean Fasulis, who's on, uh, if she's still with us, um, is one of our co-coordinators for our book club. Uh, so I think that's a, a, you know, a great idea. And the more we interface with one another, the potential for us to be finding some of that red and blue, uh, even among ourselves, you know, could be helpful. So I made some notes. I think our other Glen Allen folks made some notes too. So yeah, we're would be great to talk to uh, talk to you about it. Uh, that would be wonderful if you could uh, kind of collectively organize a red mm -hmm. blue blue workshop. And I'd be happy to. I can't do the recruiting. You really need to talk to people individually and mm -hmm. and uh, you know uh, get them to uh, uh, buy into it. But uh, I could certainly help you by uh, explaining what it is and what you need to do. Right. Uh, on this point that Don has brought up about bringing people together really quickly, Chuck, um, has Braver Angels done presentations to elected municipalities, to state level leaders, federal level? Is there a Braver Angels in Congress right now? Uh, I know. Um, I'm the, I'll speak to the league part and then Chuck could answer the rest, but uh, the league just did, just brought Chuck and Madeline to the League of Women Voters of Illinois through the issues and advocacy specialists. Um, so we did have them present to the League of Women Voters of Illinois, and then we did this chapter follow up and encourage all league chapters to do this same presentation, and then Chuck can speak to the other thing. Yeah, well, first I'd like to say we did that uh, presentation a week after the Capitol uh, insurrection, and we're doing this one the start of a uh, an impeachment, and that's been the case over the last uh, several, the last four years, the entire time of our existence, is that it is always at a time when there are new sort of outrages and new reasons for uh, the the sides to kind of be uh, polarized. Um, and there is no better time to get started in this work than now, because there is not going to be a calm moment uh, until we kind of have worked on this. Um, so, and what was the, uh, the, the, what was uh, this? I, I, was, I was wondering if you've had any elected officials, municipalities, oh, yes. local governments, you know, reach out to you and say, we, we, we want this, we need it. Yeah, well, uh, we have done uh, in Minneapolis, there's somebody who has a friend in Minneapolis, uh, uh, the uh, two congressional staffs uh, did a red blue workshop. So there was a, a red and blue Congress uh, person there uh, and their staffs did the workshop. And we've worked with local uh, legislators. Uh, I talked to a couple yesterday, uh, actually in Rockford, um, and uh, we would be happy to do workshops and have done workshops uh, with local legislators as well. So yes, and again, it, it helps, you know, I can make cold calls, but it helps if somebody who knows somebody um, and says that this is a good program talks to them uh, first. So that's really what we need is people to get involved uh, and to become organizers uh, of events. And then if you have facilitation experience to become moderators or uh, debate chairs as well. Uh, I have a question. Um, thank you so much, Chuck and Madeline for this presentation. Very, very informative. Up until Roberta um, or, and her group organized this, I, I had never heard of you folks before. So this is definitely educational and I'm glad that a lot of our league is on this. I wanted to ask you about, did you, were you founded about 2015 or 16, did you say? And would you be able to let us know? I know you said you're vol mostly volunteer. How do you become a volunteer in your organization? Um, well, I can tell you how 
I did. And uh, uh, Madeline uh, also has a, a story about this. And maybe I've talked enough. Uh, Madeline, do you want to tell about the American One Room? Um, well, I think you're asking, like, what would be the next step if you wanted to volunteer with Braver Angels? And you could just become a member. And we offer free training for um, to become an organizer, which is really important because I've ended up like organizing and running events and that's a huge amount of work. So we need organizers. I'm trained as a debate chair. Um, Chuck is, tra is trained as a facilitator for several of the workshops. So all that training is offered for free and it's, it's, it's very structured and you've got people to help you through it. You know. And so for instance, before I chaired my first debate, I shadowed one. Um, you know, I recently shadowed as a, as a whip, you know, one of the assistants at the debate. So it's good training. They don't, you're not just thrown in and not been able to do it. And it's, you know, those are good skills to have. So it's, it's easy. Just sign up to become a member and, you know, check out, I would like to get training and then you can go from there. Okay. But yeah, I, we'd love, we'd love to have you. We need, we need more help in Illinois. We need more people. We have more ideas than we have people to make them happen. Great. Yeah, and you know what's happened is after the election, we had a bump in membership and and a greater demand for workshops and debates. And then after the insurrection, the same thing. Um, so we need uh, uh, people to get involved as organizers, as moderators, as, as debate chairs. And I would be happy. My uh, email is in the uh, chat, and my phone number. I could put it in the chat too. It's 312-833-0016. And the first step usually is to contact me and we'll talk and we'll see what kind of contribution you want to make, what area you're, you're interested in uh, delving into and uh, what you should do to kind of get up to speed uh, about it. And then, um, you know, I think this is a, a problem that is so broad uh, and so deeply rooted that we all need to make whatever contribution we can make and uh, Donna has already made some with our slides, uh, for example, because uh, she has a, a talent for that. Um, but uh, I would be happy to talk to you and we'll kind of brainstorm and, and yeah. see what's best for you. And uh, I am a resource to save you time. Um, but yeah, the first step is becoming a member um, and it's, it's $12 a year. And it's, yeah. I say it's betting on America. That's yeah. how I think about it. Well, I, I want to make two more comments just to say that I, I really, what resonated with me um, is when you were saying, Madeline, that sometimes when you're, if you, I think you just need to listen to someone and be respectful. And you, you know, you're not really trying to change their mind, but you might, you just, I feel like with all the social media and everything, it's just gotten out of control. And um, I think a group like yours, I think can really benefit people um, just as we move forward. So I just, I, again, I wanna thank you and um, I, we'll be in touch with you. The League of Women Voters of Glenelg is very interested in this. So, so we'll be in touch with you. Well, thank, thank you. you. I'll give you a jazz fingers for that. Thank you. <laughs> that would be wonderful. Uh, Ann, do you, Ann Downs, you've had, your hand up, it might have been. Do you have a question or comment? I do not have a question or comment. That was from way earlier when I was uh, introducing myself. Okay. So. I thought it was up for a long time. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, right, I don't know how a, to get rid of that little hand thing. <laughs> this is Pete Pellegrino. I do have a, a quick comment and question. First, thank you for the presentation. It was excellent. And thank you for the league for putting this together. Um, and this question comes both from a, a business perspective and from a government perspective. I, you know, I've been involved in being an executive leadership for quite a bit in, uh, in organizations. And you know, I've led a ton of strategic meeting initiatives. And you know, my question is, you know, as you're bringing a group together, and I think uh, kind of piggybacking on Kristen's comment of listening to people, it seems like whenever you get a group together, whether it's a small group, big group, business, government, when questions are posed, there's less of a tendency to answer the question and more of a tendency to react to something about the individual that's asking the question. How do you deal with that in your workshops to help overcome that? 
Yeah, uh, well, the red blue workshop is probably the most similar to that. And that is that we set down the rules at the beginning. So these are structured conversations. Um, and for the reason that Madeline talked about um, is that without a structure, people do exactly what you're saying. There's a react reactiveness uh, and a lack of listening. So at the beginning of the red blue, we do a kind of, I think of it as the Miranda warnings that the moderators are there to enforce the rules and the rules are that you're not going to um, uh, try to convert somebody that, uh, and that you are going to kind of bring your best selves to the table, be respectful uh, and so forth. And you're gonna allow the moderators to uh, interrupt you if necessary, to redirect you. We're only gonna uh, do you know, one topic at a time. So it's not gonna range around uh, uh, and that usually that pretty much always works. So the, uh, the moderators are in the role of partly as referees. Um, well, we saw so, how sometimes the moderators can control the debates during this last political season. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And put me in charge because <laughs> especially with the mute button. Um, I think the second one went better. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you have to, actually give the moderator uh, of the debate some power and the ability to look, these are the rules, you agreed to the rules, okay, we're gonna enforce the rules. Um, and then ask questions that uh, are not intended to be sort of, you know, gotcha questions, ask questions that uh, like the League of Women Voters asks to get people to explain their positions and so forth. Um, yeah. Does that answer your question, Pete? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. The other thing to remember is that the people that come to these, they want to take part in this. It's not, you didn't just grab people off the street and throw them in a room. So they at least had good intentions when they came in. And so it's, sometimes it's just a matter of reminding them, um, you know, what the rules are. It's not like you have to wrestle them to the ground. Yeah. Uh, Diana asked a question in chat, uh, how do we address the lack of modeling among participants we see at the national and state levels without bad mouthing our own leaders? Um, so that's a great question. And it's sort of the goal is that uh, we eventually won't have leaders uh, who play political games that uh, kind of demonize people on the other side. Um, and I think that one of the sad things is I think that the modeling that you've talked about is actually happening in all of our relationships so that we see a way of looking at the world from politics and from our political leaders. And it kind of bleeds into all of our relationships that the world is divided into good people and evil people. And I think it makes our friendships more fragile, our family relationships more fragile I think friendships don't form as easily as before. Um, so it's, it's a culture problem um, and we need to do it. We really need to do it for future generations um, because our culture right now is, is kind of really committed to disconnecting us and to isolation and anxiety and depression. And it's all because of these bad habits I think that we've gotten into. The other thing I'll mention is that this isn't really that easy to do. <laughs> like um, Chuck and I, when we were preparing for the, the, the Illinois League of Women Voters presentation, he made a comment and right, despite having been in these workshops, I mean, and partly because we're friends, I mean, I, I jumped all over him. I was, <laughs> I didn't do any of the things that I was supposed to do. You know, we kind of laughed it off, but you know, in the end, I didn't really get to hear details about how he felt. And, you know, we could go back and revisit that, but it's not just a matter of going to these workshops. It's, it's practicing it. It's, it's, it's hard because we've got these leaders, because we've got this culture surrounding us, you know, that interrupts and that argues. It, it, it takes a while to get past that, even with good intentions. That's my experience. Yeah, I agree 100%. And it's pretty deep seated. And right now, there are people who are pretty happy with attacking the other side. Um, they just think it's it's the righteous thing to do. And plus, they like it. Yeah. So 
So I am terribly sorry, but we do need to bring the program to a close. And Chuck and Madeline, I really appreciate your time tonight and um, just this fabulous presentation. And as Donna brought up, and it, you know, the some of the folks from Glenelg, and we'll be we'll be talking. And Chuck, you've shared your contact information. So if anyone else has questions, concerns, comments. I hope that the group will reach out. And I really want to thank everyone for participating. Don't forget that Linfred has a truffle and wine package and it's a fundraiser for the league. So that would be really nice and make a nice Valentine's gift for somebody. So Roberta, is there anything that you would like to add at this point in time to close the program? I just want to thank Chuck and Madeline, this was a fabulous presentation. We could go on and on and on and on and on. And yeah. it is a conversation we really need to have. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. And I hope we can continue this conversation going forward. Joan? Terrific. Thank you everybody for participating. Thank you Good for night. opening it up to us. Good, Good night, night, everybody. Thank Good you. Night. Good night. Thank you. Good night.